the amount of data and feeds and things that are available, the amount that is tracked in your vehicle, specifically the amount of data that's logged, cameras everywhere that you don't know are there, you get in an accident, the amount of stuff that feeds in on that accident takes away a lot of the debate over the years about what happened because they have a picture of you looking at your cell phone. That was James Nettles, a 35-year business and technology consultant who works in the insurance industry. He and I were panelists, along with two other gentlemen, at the Electronic Frontiers Forums in Atlanta, Georgia, where we discussed insurance rates and your privacy in the era of drones, satellites, and big data. I am Dr. John Padfield. I'm a business professor and a former Indiana State Representative, and this is Business Reform, where we discuss issues at the intersection of business, technology, and society. I was given permission by Electronic Frontiers Forums to create this shortened version of the panel discussion. This is the last of three videos I am posting from the panel discussions I participated in over this past Labor Day weekend. And if you are wondering if those hidden cameras are real, the short answer is yes. Driver monitoring systems use a driver-facing camera to determine if the driver has their eyes wide open and is looking straight ahead. The system will alert you if it decides you are not paying enough attention to the road. These systems are already being built into many Lexus, Cadillacs, and BMWs, and the 2021 Bipartisan Infrastructure Law requires car makers to build driver monitoring systems into all new cars. The buyers of these cars should know that the cameras are there, but that doesn't automatically mean that all of the people who drive or people who ride in these vehicles will know about the cameras. Now, on to the panel discussion. Rich Gatz, I'm the head of cyber claims at Arch Insurance. Um, I'm a lawyer by trade. My name is Matthew Griglia. I'm a historian, author, activist, um, and a senior policy analyst at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which is a nonprofit civil liberties group focusing on technology policy out of San Francisco. I'm Jim Nettles. My main life is in business and technology consulting. <laughs> 35 years in and around financial services, um, banking, investments, blockchain, and insurance. Uh, I've spent much of my career uh, designing, building, working with insurance companies, designing products like cyber. I have been in risk management, and so I'm very much in both the technology aspects of it, uh, but I'm also a consultant in the industry. The first question I wanted to ask of, of the panel, and whoever wants to take this feel free, is, is more data better right like in our technological world it seems we're just getting you know hit over the head with data 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 right from an insurance perspective and from a policyholder perspective do we think data is better and so the way i want to ask this is from like the insurance carrier side which maybe i'll take unless you guys want to and then also from the policyholder side so why don't we start with the policyholder side first um so from a policyholder side, the answer is some data, some additional data is better. The problem is you do not know how much is already collected and aggregated, which is literally everything. Um, building data feeds, things like that, the amount of information that insurers carry, bring in and are able to access and then tie to your premiums, your rates, all of that is significantly more than you can imagine and really at this point the only data they don't have access to is the stuff that doesn't entirely exist yet um if you look back about if i go back when i first started you could get tons of data we just didn't have the processing capability to do anything with it um now big data and the ability to use ai to go crunch that and actually do personalization on it the number of products, it's not that do they need more data, it's literally almost a matter of what do they not have. Um, and so if you have, uh, if you've submitted, you know, to 23andMe or any of these sorts of things, yeah, you know, you've given up that data, you've given up that rights, pretty much everything you have and everything you do is being sold every day. Let, you me, can let me ask you a quick you. question, like a specific instance. So a lot of car insurance companies will give you this thing that you can plug in that monitors your driving mm -hmm. all right so it's collecting data on how fast you're driving how fast you how hard you brake, things like that 
does that specific tool benefit the policyholder? It can. Um, I've, I've built some of the integrations and stuff to pull that kind of data. Um, but here's part of what's coming is that's going to they're go, it's going from being something that's incentivized to something that's been discussed in legislation to make mandatory. And so it'll go away from being those devices to being just a data feed from your car. Um, and so the amount of data that's already available from most vehicles made in the last, I'm, I'm going to genuinely or generally call five years, but the amount of data and feeds and things that are available, the amount that is tracked in your vehicle specifically the amount of data that's logged cameras everywhere that you don't know are there you get in an accident the amount of stuff that feeds in on that accident takes away a lot of the debate over the years about what happened because they have a picture of you looking at your cell phone they have the picture of, of knowing how much you were playing with that cell phone because they'll have the last 30 seconds of video of what you were doing when that accident happened i wanted to point out that data has always been used in insurance what i what i see is the nature of the data is shifting in the past if we just look at something like auto insurance get a speeding ticket that's data get a speeding ticket your rates are going to go up be involved in an accident that's data your insurance rates are going to go up but now the shift is going from this has happened your rates are going up to this could happen. Your rates are going up. Yeah, with uh, predictive and the, the, behavior. The, the comment about the uh, the insurance devices. Uh, Matt and I were on a panel in this room yesterday talking about uh, the challenge of opting out of telematics. Right now, the state of Texas is suing General Motors for sharing that stream of data for the past ten years. the The lawsuit. It's a thirty six page lawsuit against GM. Um, Attorney General Ken Paxton said that it started in 2015 and that GM has been selling data without the consent of the customers for that long a time. So in my mind, I, I see a very sharp distinction between I volunteer to work with my insurance company, get a device to plug into the OBD port on my car and share that information with the insurance company versus Without my consent, General Motors decides to sell my data to an insurance company. General Motors side is well, you consented to that, and customers are saying, I know nothing about it because, uh, according to the lawsuit, dealerships were trained on how to railroad people into agreeing to this. And uh, some of the salespeople were assisting people in, uh, in agreeing to this. I think another important point is just that there's obviously there's so much data being collected on you all the time and almost all of it can be used to infer something about your health. And so with all of that being up for grabs, the idea that, you know, um, I mean, I've seen cases where police try to get access to people's um, the, the electric use in their house to know whether they're home or not. And, and there's a, a big demand for this data about how much electricity your home is using to, in part to just figure out whether you're home or not um and so just thinking about like you know what insurance could infer about you and your healthy lifestyle if your lights are on all night long um or uh how many steps your phone records you taking because we know like you know recording uh how many steps you take in a day is something like we know insurance companies give out Fitbits to people for this exact purpose. Smart fridges records, you know, so I've seen some of that record what is in your fridge at any given time, like your eating habits, link to your credit card, what, where you're buying food from, what you're buying at the grocery store. Like all of this is data that is collected that the, the insurance industry can get their hands on if they haven't already. I, I would, yeah. I would probably, you know, respectfully disagree and just a little bit in that, um, insurance companies have to ask for your consent to get data right like i understand insurance companies bad i get that but you know yes a ton of data is being collected but from a carrier perspective you generally need a lot of consent for it in the personal context okay like for health insurance you you know if you're sharing health data like you have hipaa right you have a lot of data privacy protections at both the state and federal level to to make sure that people aren't just sharing your stuff willy-nilly and then hence the the texas action you know so yes there's a ton of data out there but i would say that 
you know, as of right now, your health insurance company is not, you know, buying data from Samsung Smart Bridge. Maybe in the future they could, which is well, you know, a good point. It, it represents a vulnerability. Yeah, it, I wonder it, what the decrease of premium would be for something like that, right? Well, but that's the part I would add is that's where that's where it always starts, right? No matter what it is, is either do it for convenience or I'll give you a discount for something. Think about your grocery store cards, the shopper cards, so that I can link all of your data together. Um, again, 60% of all the shopper cards, it doesn't matter what store you go to, all go through one system. You're only going through about three data systems for all of that shopper data. But it starts with, oh, it's either going to be convenience or I'm going to give you a discount or on this to get you to consent. And then it becomes the wait. I didn't understand there were implications to getting a discount. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I mean, I think if there's one takeaway that you have from this panel is understand what you're agreeing to. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, sorry, I wrote this down stream of consciousness, so hopefully I, I make sense here. So the point I was uh, getting, I believe, from uh, Mr. Gatz was don't worry, your insurance company is heavily regulated by the uh, government, so you're fine. The uh, government's here to help you. So so your information okay. is safe because there's too much, and also your information is safe because it's too much work to analyze and get consent from uh, Mr. Nettles, right? It's too hard to get to build the algorithm, so there's no financial incentive to today. look at this data. Today. today. When the AI gets smart enough to do it, then we'll have them do it automatically. Um, doesn't uh, Florida and the housing insurance debacle, which, which we just hinted at uh, just a minute ago, uh, and there are junk insurance companies that they have all over the state now. Doesn't that hint that the companies and the politicians that they have in their pockets hint otherwise drones being allowed to make snap judgments? Isn't that kind of like your doctor doing a, a Zoom check and making a diagnosis over the, uh, over the internet? I mean, I think in general, one of the big problems that is kind of universal to all of this is just how patently unregulated uh, the the data sales landscape is. I mean, we have no federal consumer privacy regulations at all in the United States. So if you give your, you know, the whole problem we were talking about is like, uh oh, what is the insurance industry buying? And then how are they going to use it? But really, I mean, there are no regulations preventing them from buying any of this stuff anyway, uh, regardless of how they're eventually or not going to use it. So, I mean, I think one of the big things we're touching on here is, in my opinion, the insurance industry is underregulated, but also even maybe more immediate a need than that is for federal consumer privacy regulation. Yes. Yeah. And I, I would throw in one other thing on top of that. Th there's a, a term that many of you may be familiar with called regulatory capture. It is frequently used in context of pharmaceutical industry, also used in context of the agricultural industry. I am not saying that this has happened with the insurance industry. That's not my expertise. But regulatory capture is where due to dollars, due to people moving from government to the private sector and from private sector to government, agency, excuse me, businesses that are supposed to be regulated end up capturing the regulatory agency. Look at executives from Big Pharma, look at who runs the FDA, and then look at where they used to work five, 10 years ago. It's a revolving door. That's called regulatory capture. The, the regulated become the regulators. And like I said, I am not saying that this is going on in, in, in uh, insurance. I don't know. But um, this is one of my big concerns when it comes to privacy legislation. We do need privacy legislation. I don't want Google and Facebook writing it. Since that panel discussion on August 31st, I have spent some time researching regulatory capture in the insurance industry, and it appears to be about as prevalent in the insurance industry as it is in the pharmaceutical industry. But those details are a topic for another video. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing, and if you want to watch the full hour-long panel discussion, click on this link.